welcome to everyone attending. We've got some people from across the world um, tuned in this evening, but most people are from South Africa. Very warm welcome. I'm Lynette Rudman, and I will be your host tonight. I'm coming to you live from Grahamstown in South Africa. This is the last of the series of the March month, Women's Month, Women in Birding. And um, Kerry is a shining example of a woman that is very involved in bird conservation, especially vulture conservation. And we're really looking forward to her talk tonight. This webinar is being recorded and it will be on our Learn the Birds YouTube channel in a few days time. So you can watch it again or um, tell one of your friends to watch it if they missed this webinar. If there are any questions or answers that you want um, Kerry to answer after her talk, please post them in the chat box below. Um, our special guest is Kerry Bolter from Volpro. It's an organization that rehabilitates injured vultures. And shame, she's so busy. It really keeps her very busy with vultures that have collided with power lines or have been poisoned or whatever. She's extremely busy with that. And some of the vultures that are not able to fly, they're used in captive breeding. And those vultures that are born in captivity are eventually released. So it's a really amazing story um, about the work that Kerry does at Volpro. Just a bit about Kerry. She left a corporate job in a boring office environment to work out in nature. And she found after a while that this work, working with vultures, was her life's calling. We really look forward to your talk. Kerry, over to you. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, really appreciate it. And yeah, it's an honor for, for me. So, yeah, my talk is really about, you know, a holistic approach to, to saving um, Southern Africa's vultures, but our work actually extends globally as well. So, you know, what we have done has had really positive implications for vultures all over the world, really. And I wanted to start off um, with this slide, um, and it's something that I... I Put together a while back where in today's environment we are seeing such catastrophic distractions from various weather conditions um you know through drought to flooding to um our ice melting to to crazy snowstorms and in addition to that we're seeing huge escalations in poaching and killing of, of rhinos and elephants, lions, pangolins, and, and even vultures. I'm sure a lot of you saw the latest um, uh, uh, poisoning stats in Kruger National Park. Um, and, and that poisoning has led to an increase in vulture harvesting for belief-based purposes as well. And, you know, we as humans are killing our earth by, by destroying what was given to us to protect, preserve, and nurture. And at the end of the day, really, human greed is going to destroy us all. And this is the sad, sad reality. And it, it was because of this that, you know, I found my life in corporate very um, unfulfilling and, and quite sad in that, you know, in a corporate environment, we kind of forget about the greatest reasons of why us human beings are actually here. And this is really where my story begins. Um, and to me, this is a lesson for everyone. I'm not an ornithologist at all. I'm self-taught. I, I studied business management and marketing. And what I knew about birds was I knew ch about chickens. And I mean, who in Africa doesn't know about the call of the fish eagle? You know, I grew up going to the bush and everyone really knows the call of the fish eagle which is really the, the 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 call of africa and this is exactly what i knew about vultures 
just what we know about the dodo birds. <laughs> I, I knew absolutely nothing about them. And yet I was given an opportunity to manage a Volta study group when now about 21 years ago. And that is really where things started for me. But you know, to cut a long story short, we are facing an African Volta crisis and things are not looking good for the species. And again, I just highlight the poisoning that's happened in Kruger National Park. And there is a real chance our vault is going extinct in our lifetime, specifically local extinctions in some parts of South Africa, um, as well as Africa. Now, I want to focus on the whiteback vault here for a minute because of what's happening in Kruger National Park. And they estimate in the next four to five years, whitebacks could go extinct in Kruger National Park. Um, we know the white-headed vultures are already locally extinct in Zululand as a breeding species. We know the Cape vulture, although they've been downlisted to vulnerable, we know they are extinct as a breeding species already in Zimbabwe, Swaziland, and Namibia. Um, leopard face vultures, I think, is a species that's kind of slowly going under the radar, and they're not doing well in South Africa at all. Um, Namibia, they're doing pretty well, um, and, and they're very well studied in Namibia, but in South Africa, I think they really are going under the radar. And then I think many of us know the bearded vultures in South Africa, although it talks about globally here as endangered, in South Africa, they are actually critically endangered with you know, very, very few left, probably as many as there are of white-headed vultures left, which is about 100, 150. So if you look at the rate of declines in the last 30 years, your white-headed has declined by 96% uh, in the last 30 years, your white-backs by 90%. Your hooded vultures are also critically endangered with a rate of 83% decli uh, percent decline. Egyptian vultures, we know, are extinct as a breeding species in South Africa. Cape vultures have declined by 92% in the last 30 years. Lapids, 80%, and bearded vultures, 70%. And, and those declines are just continuously escalating, unfortunately. Why? Well, you know, what we deal with, sorry, I see these pictures have not come out very well, and I'm not quite sure why, and I apologize for that. Um, you know, Volcro deal, deals with mass power line um, interactions, which have devastating implications to these birds. And in fact, uh, I've just had a vulture that's been dropped off at my doorstep as we speak from colliding with the power line. And what happens is these collisions cause various breaks. I mean, the two top pictures are birds. Well, sorry, the one picture, which hasn't come out well, is a bird that collided with power lines, broke its wing, had to have its wing amputated. The other three are electrocutions, actually. Um, the one top with the, the feather, you can see the feathers kind of coming out. Um, he survived an electrocution, amazingly, very few survive electrocutions, but what happens with that is that particular bird is all the flesh had died off. If you look at the bottom one with the bone sticking out, he too survived an electrocution, and after weeks of being out in the field, obviously we could not save him, and, and that leg was gone. Most times it's an immediate death reaction. Um, and, and the difference between poisoning and power lines is power lines, is it's a daily occurrence. You know, it might be one at one structure, but how many are we actually finding? And we estimate we only find probably about 10% of those individuals. You then look at poisoning, and poisoning is, is fewer events, but catastrophic at those particular events. And so instead of having one individual bird, for example, at that event, you have an, an, a scene that can wipe out an entire colony at one sitting. Um, and so again, the results are catastrophic. Then what I think is going to be the biggest threat for vultures in Africa is the trade in vultures for belief-based purposes. And 
This we are seeing escalating on a daily basis where vultures are being killed for muti or witchcraft or belief-based, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this actually results in security risks for, for us as an organization that is involved in sting operations and, and trying to save individuals from the muti trade. Um, and it's it's a very precarious threat to actually deal with because of, of the safety aspects. Um, to put things into perspective, I was messaged a couple of times after I moved by some locals, which we had done a sting operation saying, you know, I can save as many vultures as we want, but they'll keep killing them once we've released them. Um, we've had people knocking on our doors asking if we sell vultures. People asking to do sting operations, but saying that they will come to us to bring us the birds. And obviously we don't want anyone at, at our facilities. So this is a very, very difficult threat to deal with, as well as dealing with, with one's safety in mind. Then I'm sure a couple of you know about the threat of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Many of us have already heard about the Asian vulture crisis, which um, an anti, a non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drug called diclofenac, which is actually the human drug as Voltaren, led to the demise, almost demise, of the Asian vultures, uh, which um, declined by 99.9%. Um, in South Africa, diclofenac is not available for animals, but we all know Voltaren is available, but there are other drugs that are as toxic as diclofenac is. Um, we've done extensive research into those drugs, and at this stage, there is only still one, potentially two NSAIDs that are safe for um, vultures to be exposed to, and that either being through direct veterinary treatment or in their food um, chain. This is a new one that we are dealing with, um, drowning in farm dams. You know, many years ago, actually, before I joined Vulture Conservation, drowning was classified as a big threat, but I'd only dealt with one or two, you know, single incidences. In the since I've I've moved to the Eastern Cape in March, we have lost thirty vultures in just two drowning incidents. Um, and what we think is happening here is is as these incredible temperatures, you know, we're having in the Eastern Cape of forty odd degrees, very low rainfall, the concrete dams are evaporating, so they're not full, and vultures looking for water are finding these water sources and are not able to get out. There is easy ways of addressing it. The problem is just to find all these concrete dams that are unsafe. And it is something that we are addressing and looking into. Um, but this has been a real shock to our system. All of these are cap vultures. Um, the one incident you can see with the image of the birds in the water, most of those were adults. And on the other incident, most of them were young birds. So it is pretty bleak. And then, of course, um, direct persecution um, and also just direct disturbance, whether that be through aviation or hiking or tourism or kind of building alongside uh, tree nesting um, birds. And I see this a lot in nature reserves, believe it or not. One of the reserves which, which I was studying extensively we're building houses during breeding season right next to breeding um, a, a trees that were used as breeding nesting sites. And of course, those birds, and there were three actually at this one particular tree, have never returned again. So we see a lot of this, and also some reserves are now doing helicopter flips down rivers. And um, a lot of vultures breed along the river courses, and this obviously terrifies the birds as well and interferes with their breeding. So, you know, there's a lot of um, an a lack of education or a lack of awareness. Um, or when it comes to tourism and money, people tend to forget what is the right thing to do, unfortunately. 
Um, so what does Volpro do? And this is, I think, where we are slightly different to other organizations. We do not believe protecting vultures in their natural environment is enough. With the, the rate of decline is, is far too great to only look at protecting vultures in their natural habitat. Um, and the threats are far too great. So we are a multifaceted organization. Um, and at this stage, we house the largest collection of non-releasable African vultures in the world. And this quote, your, one of our focus is um, rehabilitation. And a lot of people ask us, why do we undertake rehabilitation? And this quote really does put things into perspective. As the old man walked the beach at dawn, he noticed a young man ahead of him picking up starfish and flinging them into the sea. Finally, catching up with the youth, he asked him why he was doing this. The answer was that the stranded starfish would die if left until the morning sun. But the beach goes on for miles and there are millions of starfish, counted the other. How can your efforts make any difference? The young man looked at the starfish in his hand and then threw it to the safety in the waves. It makes a difference to that one. And that's exactly it. Every single individual bird that comes our way, we are making a difference. Whether we can release them again, whether we house them in captivity, whether we can end their suffering, either way, we are making a difference to that individual. Um, and that is important. And by saving individuals, we're saving populations. You know, we need to understand that populations are made of individuals. So one cannot, one shouldn't only look, you know, from a population level. You've got to make, you've got to look on an individual level. So some cases are interesting and we, we get some really weird and wonderful cases. This young bird that you can see stuck in a tree was actually stuck in a tree and he couldn't get out. And it was a hiker that actually um, contacted us about this bird. He was stuck at, at one of the hiking routes. He broke his wing, unfortunately, trying to get out. But, you know, he will join our breeding program in due course. These two individuals are power line victims. The one in the sling had a hard landing. And so he's in the sling because he was not able to, to walk. The other one had his wings successfully pinned. Um, both of these individuals were actually released, um, which is the ultimate goal of any rehabilitation program. You know, we don't, we don't want to have birds in captivity. We want to release as many as we possibly can and give them a second chance at freedom and continuously contributing to their species by naturally breeding out in the wild. Um, but that is not always possible, and this is where our uniqueness further comes into play. Um, with those individuals that cannot be released, we allow them to be incorporated into our capture breeding program, and we are the only facility in Africa that, that's currently doing this. We provide natural housing, we try and give them as natural environments as we possibly can for them to succeed, as well as for the parents to raise their own chick, which is important. We want a hands-off approach, and we do not want to interfere with the breeding. The only thing we do is artificially incubate the egg to safeguard the egg because we have disabled vultures inside an enclosure. And this is where our partnership with Shamari has um, has has come about, you know, with holding so many vultures in captivity, we needed to lo start looking at um, really focusing and streamlining vultures' work and not having all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. So what I wanted to do is show you the video that was made to show the relocation. I don't know if many of you have seen this, but it it was pretty amazing. And I just wanted to show you what the relocation entailed.
2024, we are going to be moving in the first phase cape vultures and white back vultures from the current rehabilitation and breeding centre in the Hattabiaspur Dam area down to Shamwari uh, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, this is very, very significant in the conservation world. This is one of the biggest relocations, or probably the biggest re vulture relocation of its kind ever undertaken in Africa. And we're very, very excited that Vulpro have chosen us as an ideal destination for the vultures. Vultures, and I'm going to specifically refer to cave vultures, are Southern Africa's only endemic vulture species. There's only about 4,200 breeding pairs left globally. So South Africa is the stronghold for the species and in fact it is really important to try and prevent further losses for Cape vultures in the Eastern Cape but also bring them back because they actually fulfill a vitally important function in preventing disease outbreaks. And in addition, if vultures are lost in an ecosystem, it is incredibly difficult to remind people to live in harmony with a species that has gone extinct. So we need to do it before we get to that stage. <laughs> Volpro really was established to dedicate its time, 100% of its time, to protect, conserve, and try and change mindsets of the public as to the importance of vultures and why we need to protect them. We have a very holistic approach and when I say holistic we don't only protect the birds in the wild but we also do a lot of ex situ conservation work. So what we do is we do extensive rehabilitation so we believe every single vulture deserves a second chance. Also by being able to rehabilitate and release birds back into the wild we're preventing further losses. We then have taken that further. Because a lot of the birds are not releasable, we're only able to release about 60% of those birds that come in. They then form part of a captive breeding program where they successfully breed. And although they themselves cannot be released back into the wild, their offspring can. And so by releasing their offspring into the wild, we're able to supplement the dwindling vulture populations, but also look at areas where the species has become extinct and where they have historically occurred, we're then able to utilize these offspring and release them in the wild and repopulate those areas. So what we're doing today is removing most of the birds that, that's, that's in the captive breeding program. And the reason for that is that's birds that's almost like permanently compromised. Some have got wing injuries that, that didn't heal 100%, but have blind eyes and so on. So these birds... Location today, I'm a little bit nervous because every single bird needs to be captured. Uh, put in a box and then all these boxes get loaded in very big trucks. The DHL company, we're very grateful for them that they made their trucks available for us in sponsoring this transport. And all these crates are being made by We Wild Africa, so they're assisting. So it's a, it's a combination of quite a few companies that's, that's assisting us. But uh, the, the main issue is that we're concerned about is heat. It's midsummer, we have to uh, translocate the birds now because the juveniles are just, just, just old enough for the translocation. But we also can't wait longer because then the breeding is going to start and we don't want to interfere with that process. All the birds are loaded. It actually went a bit quicker than, than I expected. We didn't have any problems, no injuries to the guys uh, capturing the birds. But everything is loaded, just trapping the, the crates, uh, and then we'll close up and go. 
still a little bit on the hot side, but not too bad. But I'm very happy that we got to the stage. Now we've got an 18-hour trip ahead of us. Uh, it's probably going to be a little bit tired tomorrow when we get there, but it's part of it. The massive DHL vehicles are about to arrive with the 160 Cape and Whiteback Vultures. Uh, they'll be arriving at any minute now, but this is a massive achievement for Shimori. And, uh, and as I've said frequently, it's as important as moving 160 rhinos uh, back to the Eastern Cape. I mean, the Cape Vultures are endemic to the Eastern Cape. These birds that are coming down here, uh, they can breed, but they can't fly. So the healthy young chicks will be released back into the wild. So it's a massive day for Shimori. We're all very, very excited. And we're really looking forward to this uh, to this release this morning. This whole entire translocation has been incredibly emotional for me, and um, yeah, I'm trying to kind of hold it together and not burst out crying. Um, lots of different emotions, a lot of butterflies going around, um, but yeah, I just. I think as soon as I see the track, I'll probably end up bursting out crying. These birds, I think they had a long, long trip. Uh, it was quite difficult to I had a good look at every everyone because of the way the crates are stacked. But I think uh, they'll be very happy if we start opening here. So the quicker we do that, the better. Fortunately, it's quite cool. We had quite a obstacle about 50 kilometers from here. The whole road got blocked because of big wind turbines that was moving past. And the last thing we want at the end of a trip like this, the last thing we want is uh, stationary trucks. But uh, fortunately, we threw all of that and we can start offloading now. Yo, this is what we've been working at for the last couple of months. Uh, so this is really, it's, it's almost like, like a little bit emotional, but so glad it's being done. I'm so glad we did build all of this. And uh, the fact that these birds are going to be completely free quite soon, unbelievable. It's very, very important in, 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 in terms of what Shamari have been trying to achieve over, over 30 odd years. Um, you know, we started with them bringing back the antelope species, uh, the major herbivores like elephant, black rhino, white rhino, buffalo, and then eventually the cats. The red-billed oxpecker was reintroduced as well. Flightless dung beetles were reintroduced. And now this is the next chapter in our journey, which is the reintroduction of the Cape vulture to the Eastern Cape and also the, the breeding of the other vulture species at our at our breeding and rehabilitation center in the Eastern Cape. It just is the ongoing journey. There are a few other species that we'd like to bring back to Shamori if we can become bigger in size. Like we'd love to bring the, uh, the wild dog back and the spotted hyena, but to be able to do that, we'll have to uh, acquire more land and increase the size of Shamori. But that's all down the pipeline. So it fits in exactly with our conservation ethos of conserving a vanishing way of life and rewilding this entire area where Shamwari is based. The reason why Shamwari is such a perfect fit is really because of the ethos and what the reserve has done to bring species back into the Eastern Cape. And vultures is a species that is, I think, is one out of three species that hasn't been brought back into Shamwari. But over and above that, the support, the size of the reserve, the habitat, and the historical nature of what we are trying to do where Cape vultures used to occur around the area, including Shamari, is really important. So it is a perfect synergy to bring the birds back and to do it at Shamari, but to also create the largest captive breeding population 
at a site which has phenomenal support and has phenomenal reputation in being able to bring species back into an area. And I don't think anywhere else in the country has been as successful as what Shamari has been. Okay, so on that note, um, other aspects of our work is we we do extensive research and the, the first release video that we had, you would have noticed um, a vulture flying off with a wing tag. A lot of our research has shown what is safe and what is not safe and we no longer wing tag vultures because we have seen it's detrimental and I think it's always important from a research element that we're always monitoring ourselves as well as researching the birds and maximizing what we what we are doing and the positive impacts that we are having. And if we are not having positive impacts, then to go back to the drawing board. Um, so when we, I talk about research, I talk about research in its entirety, you know, researching our um our work in evaluating what we are doing, but also researching to understand what the population trends are, what are those threats, and by knowing what those threats are, we can then mitigate. Um, so yeah, here you can see we've gone from tagging and then to leg banding because of just some of the, the impacts that we've had and, and always analyzing our work. And then, of course, by putting tracking devices on the birds, we're able to monitor their movements. This particular individual broke all known history about Cape vultures and their movement patterns where this particular bird actually went into Zambia as well as Angola. Um, so, and, and he actually came back to breed in South Africa along the Michalisberg Mountains. Um, so we just continuously learn more and more about the vast ranges vultures actually have, which make it almost impossible to actually protect them because there are no boundaries. In addition to that is we always look at the value of vultures and try and educate and create awareness as to what those values are. And it's really important to instill a love and a belief system in the younger generation as well as adults. So we do ex extensive educational programs into schools. Um, we also take kids out into the field, into reserves, um, get rangers, um, get field guides, their teachers, the kids involved in the actual monitoring as well and the serving and, and serving to be a part of what we do. And then also to try and get that emotional connection to vultures and to showcase their magnificence. It doesn't matter how important vultures are, you can preach that until you're blue in the face. But until you are emotionally moved by the species, we do not have a fighting chance. You know, nobody is going to want to protect any species that they are not emotionally moved or touched or connected to, um, no matter their importance. And then I wanted to end off a good friend of mine, Michael Mace, who started the Californian breeding program and reintroduction program for, at San Diego Zoo, um, left a, a very powerful message a couple of years back when I attended the IUC and reintroduction workshop. And he said, and I really, really believe this, it is not an easy task to attempt to save species, but it is so worth the effort. Everything we know is integrated. And when we start to destabilize these ecosystems, there are consequences to pay. We have the ability, all of us, to affect change. Now, all we have to do is do it. Thank you. Is Hi, everyone Kerry. there? Hi, Kerry. Hi. <laughs> That was fantastic. I enjoyed every minute of it. It's such a positive thing that you are doing for these vultures. Um, are there any questions? Please, could you put them in the chat box if there are any? I was um, just going to ask you, um, have they all settled in nicely at Shamwari? 
they have they um they're all starting to breed I've, I've actually just brought another five in um so we have 21 that will be released and our releases start um our first release actually on the 23rd of april which we are very excited about it's going to be a closed event um and then i brought in two others um um uh, offspring of my own personal vulture Percy I uh, brought his his offspring to join us um who's a not a, not a releasable candidate um but they have settled so well I think the whitebacks thought they've gone to heaven because from day one they have just been absolutely so happy with their enclosure I mean these enclosures are massive you you saw in the video what Volpro looks like in those enclosures the video um, that we did doesn't really showcase the Shimwari enclosures and their, their size. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, our enclosures at Volpro are huge. Some of the biggest I have seen. These ones at Shimwari make our enclosures at Volpro Hearties look like miniatures. Um, so it is pure vulture heaven. I mean, our, our Cape Vulture breeding with the cliff has an enclosure of 30 by 60 meters. Yeah. Um, so the cliff is 30 meters long, six meters high. I mean, it looks like a, a full on cliff. The whitebacks, um, some of the ones that, you know, can fly but have one eye, they, they can't be released. They're flying in the enclosures. Our open enclosure is, I mean, when they ask me for the specs, Gull should never be in charge of specs because our measurements are really <laughs> <laughs> And I said, and nobody, nobody questioned me. So I said, well, let's go 100 by 90 meters. And they never questioned it. And of course, I arrived and I saw this enclosure and I thought, I'm never going to catch vultures again. It's huge. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, the birds are building nests. They are copulating. Um, I was hoping our breeding season would start later because of the move. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we are actually now working on phase two, believe it or not. So I'm hoping to have other species here by the end of the year. That is that is my hope now. That sounds fantastic. It sounds like the Eastern Cape's very good for them. It sounds like they're thriving. They are. They're doing so well. Let me tell you though, your weather it takes a lot to get used to. Your weather. <laughs> we have four seasons in one day here in the Eastern Cape. Yeah. Uh, I'm already sleeping in my winter PJs. So I don't know what we're going to do in the winter. Just wait till winter really comes. <laughs> okay, there's the first questions just popped in the box from David. Is there corporate beyond DHL or government support behind the mission of restoring the population? Are there additional habitats you are working to protect for the vultures? David, it's a good question. Look, you know, Volpro is a nonprofit organization. So we have a lot of support, mostly from mostly international support, actually. DHL is, is hugely instrumental in helping us, you know, with the transportation. And they do give us some financial support, but the transport has been a, an absolute game changer. Government does support us in that we have them sitting on the National Vulture Breeding Steering Committee, which has now been endorsed and is part of the National Vulture Biodiversity Management Plan. So they support us from that, from that side, but there's obviously no financial support. And to put things into perspective, even getting permits, we have to pay for our own permits even though they support our work and they authorize it and they appreciate it, they're not going to give up permits for free. Um, with regards to storing other populations, absolutely. You know, we started in Michalisburg more as a pilot study to see whether the birds do survive and whether, you know, what we are hoping to do has a positive um, impact on the species and we're happy to say it has and we're busy writing that up. The Eastern Cape has been in the past a stronghold for capes but the, the population has really declined extensively here mostly because of power lines. There have been historically poisoning events 
but we are looking at areas. If you look at the white-headed vulture that's now extinct in Zululand as a breeding species, there is talk about doing capture breeding on white-headed there. Um, we have spoken at length um, for Namibia, you know, and that's been a dream of mine. And in fact, why I started the capture breeding program is to introduce or reintroduce um, Cape vultures back into Namibia. There's been talk of Zimbabwe, but absolutely, Dave, you know, this is just the start. You know, with our white backs, we're hoping to do big things for Mapumalanga with the declines there. Um, we have the MTPA that's very, very keen in doing releases with our captive bred birds. We just need to get the get the poisoning under control there. Um, you know, I'm my plan, and, and I probably shouldn't say too much of it, but my plan is a full-on reintroduction program of Egyptian vultures in the Eastern Cape as well. So that is something that we're looking at. So this is just the start. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Dave. But yeah, we're a nonprofit organization. We are professional beggars. Um, and that that kind of what helps our, us keep going, um, if if that helps answer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then Colin um, says, I was pleased to hear your comment on the, is it patagial tags? I have always been concerned about the aerodynamic degradation they cause. Yeah, Colin, it's... You know, and, and I had to say I was I was tagging a lot of birds, but you know, when when we were getting rehab cases from from others that were tagging, you know, what's what's quite scary about tagging is that if you want to do bird ringing, you undergo extensive training. Um, you have to get a ringer's license, but there are there's no legalities with regards to tagging, which is nuts because you're piercing a hole through a bird's wing. So pretty much anyone can do it because there are no legalities behind it. But what we were seeing was so much incorrect tagging, where tagging was happening, you know, on the potassium of the bird's wings or between bones or between tendons or right in the, 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 the um, bend of the wing. So these birds were becoming grounded. And if you also tag these birds too young, the hole becomes the size of a five rand coin. And it was just, it, it was really sad seeing this, you know. And, and so I asked the Max Planck Institute in Germany to take our data and to analyze it because I wasn't happy with what was going on. And, and you know, stats is, is definitely not my area of expertise. And, and so they, they saw the huge impact wing tagging was having on our cave vultures. And interestingly enough, um, somebody's just done another paper, it's not published yet, but they've seen the same things with whitebacks. Funny enough, they didn't see it with capes, but they did see it with whitebacks. And so tagging is not the best option. And, and yet, unfortunately, it is still happening, even though we've published these papers. Um, and if you think about it, as you say, you're talking about the aerodynamics, but not only that, you know, birds are so finely tuned and adapted to flight. Who are us as human beings to interfere with that and to actually modify their wings or their feathers or piercing holes in their, their wings, you know? And sometimes I think as conservationists and or researchers, sometimes we do too much. And I think this is what we were doing there. And we were trying to make our lives easier from a visual sighting perspective. But ethically, was it the correct thing? And is it the correct thing? Um, so we now use leg bands. Um, it's not invasive. We've gone right back full circle to what the old Volta study group did many, many years ago about pulling colored leg bands on, on birds. And that's what we've gone to now. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth asks, what's the procedure for catching a vulture? So Elizabeth, it depends if you're talking about wild captures for research, you know, wanting to fit a tracking device on or take blood or a rehab bird, you know, an injured bird. So I'm going to go into the, the rehab side of things. You know, these birds are often grounded. Even a bird with a broken wing can run. So 
it's easier if you have two or three people to corner a particular bird and then when you actually capture it you know i always say to people use safety gear to protect yourself because vultures rely 100 percent on their on their eyesight so their first defense is to go for your face actually and so if you wear a peak cap and a glass and a pair of glasses it will help protect you but if you can imagine holding a snake you know, and where you would hold a snake. It was very similar to how you would handle and hold a vulture. You've got to worry about their beaks, not their legs. Once you have their beak and you, you have control over that head <laughs> and that neck, you can then pick it up. But you've got to be careful not to put your head down where the bird can actually grab your, your, um, your head or your ear or your cap or whatever. Um, when it comes to wild captures, there are different techniques. Uh, we've used both. We use capture enclosures as well as noose captures. We don't use things like cannon nets. That's in the arc ages, and I think it's quite dangerous. Noose, uh, noose leg um, traps are actually quite nice, but you don't get the numbers as you would in a capture enclosure. Nooses you can do absolutely anyway. You've got to be in close proximity to the bird because once the bird has been caught from a noose, you do need to go and intervene. Uh, a capture enclosure, you can wait a little bit longer um, once you get, let's say, 20, 30, even more in, and you can pull a curtain very safely. Um, both work very, very successfully, and both generally do not cause any um, incidences as well. I hope that answers your question. Okay, and then Ariane, I think it's Ariane, asks, thank you for the great work and wonderful presentation. How many of these vultures could be released and how many are kept in the enclosures for breeding? So we, we and, and we have done the stats, we release between 63 and 64% of the birds that come into the facility. And we get about 140 birds a year. So it's a fair amount, but, you know, after going for a couple of years, you know, the number of birds in captivity continues to increase. Um, so, yeah, but 63 to 64% and survival rate of those individuals are 75%. The ones that don't survive end up succumbing to power line um, infrastructure, unfortunately. Okay, and Lawrence asks, where in the Machalisburg is your facility? Lawrence, we're just outside of Harabiaspur Dam towards uh, Pretoria, very close to the cableway. Um, if you are keen, you can always um, email me or you can go onto our website, which is www.volpro.com and you can just connect in that way. But it's very close to the cableway if you know where that is. Okay, and then David asks, have the tracking devices been successful? Have they yielded new and useful information? David, yes, they have. I mean, I, I don't think we need to continue putting dozens and dozens of tracking devices on. Um, I don't think that is the right thing. Firstly, so we, we don't do wild captures anymore because I think there's just so many individuals that have tracking devices out there that it's just ridiculous. Um, but from a rehab and from a captive breeding point of view, we do continue because firstly with the captive bred birds, we need to understand their survival rates and their movement, their foraging, whether they've been integrated correctly, we need to check that we are actually correctly doing this and, and having the, the positive impact that we're hoping to have. So I think that is important. I think the greatest thing, David, that tracking is doing is actually helping us <laughs> argue against these wind farms and these develop, developments because without that information, these various green energy infrastructures can go up all over the place and they can decimate species. And so I think that to me is one of the most potent thing with the data that we have. So from, from a new information is yes, because we're learning where the birds are flying, 
where they're foraging, where they're breeding, where they're roosting, if there are new sites, if there are existing sites. And we need to also understand that it never ends here because with the change in weather patterns, the birds' movements could change as well. So there's continuous movement, continuous changes, and continuous things to learn, absolutely. And the data has to be used, you know, to benefit the species. And that, to me, is really important. Yeah, I was going to ask you about all these wind farms that are being erected at the moment, from Bedford almost to Grahamstown. That's... Yeah, and they're, they're not happy. They're not happy with us, the wind farms, um, because of the, the big move, and they're very, very threatened. Yeah, but our work has shown, be long before the move, vultures have been in this area, and I mean we've got historical data, you know, of thirty plus vultures way before we've even moved here, that we've shown them, and the problem is they 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 don't want that because yeah. it interferes with their plans. Um, and so, it, and I mean, these wind farms are going up all over the place. I mean, I see now Mapumalanga, one of the biggest wind farms ever is going to be happening at, uh, within the Mapumalanga province, which is, in, and that's insane. Along the Mechelisburg mountains, they're wanting to put solar farms all over the place. So, you know, the, the green ener energy infrastructure is actually taking over and it is, decimating any vacant land or even existing farmlands because it's a money making thing money with, making yeah you That's know farm, making. yeah farmers are getting paid millions for their land and so it's it's you know it's hugely problematic um are there any more questions before we wrap up there are a lot of um, members that have said thanks for a fantastic talk. It really was very interesting, and thanks for so much. Uh, um, thanks so much for the work that you're doing, Kerry. Yeah, you're really an inspiration to all of us. No, thank you. I'm just I'm just doing my my little part. <laughs> um, Your part's I... not so little. You're actually doing so much for the vultures. Wow. Um, is your Michalisburg one still functional? It is. So just an explanation there. So Michalisburg Hollabiersport continues to focus on rehabilitation. Yeah. It's the hub of where our field work happens from. So, you know, all the conservation kind of happens. We we we've got people that go from Hollabiersport and then they go out into the field. And also where a lot of our educational work is happening from. Okay. Um, we're wanting to open the facility more for education. But also, again, a lot of the field work and a lot of the communities are more along that side. Um, having said that, Shamari obviously focuses on the captive breeding side, on rehab as well. As I said, I have a vulture waiting for me in the car. Oh, sure. To go and sort out. Yeah. And we also plan to do extensive education in the area, you know, focusing in Patterson and Grahamstown. I don't know if you heard about that vulture, and I, I can't remember if it came from you, where people were selling a vulture on the side of the road in Grahamstown for Mooty. Oh, I and, haven't heard of that. That's awful. Yeah. And when we alerted the APU guys here, they went out immediately, but there was no trace, unfortunately. So that vulture landed in the wrong hands so there's a lot of work that needs to be done here as well um yeah so we're just streamlining and during breeding season my focus will be obviously trying to maximize the captive breeding side of things and getting phase two um into place um something else i was wanting to ask you the mooty shops is there anything you can do about it is it illegal do you get the police involved or... it is it is illegal um you know just like rhino horn but yeah. it's 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 very you you've got to treat so lightly yeah. because of the threats yeah. um, sometimes law enforcement is involved you know, we have we have been very successful in some sting operations. Um, 
but it doesn't go unnoticed by the community and that's where I get these threats and and I'm you know I needed to move from Hearties because I know I was being targeted and now at least here I've got the APU guys and you know they they're on a very very tight ship here um wow. but it it does become you you do put a target on your head you know because i mean anyone can google volpro and get our details and my my phone number is available for anyone yeah um, so you know what we want to do is we want to work with the traditional healers um we want to understand not condone it because we can't condone it but we need to understand and see if there are solutions yeah. um i don't think it's the traditional healers association that's the issues it's more the backyard guys yeah. that are more problematic and those are the ones that are more difficult to tap into and and you you really can't get into there because it's just not safe i mean going into you know the faraday multi market here in joburg or the one in durban is just no longer safe yeah no it's it's very dangerous actually yeah, I think your approach is good to actually um, contact them and, and, you know, like maybe make them aware that these birds are almost extinct, you know, and like kind of meet them halfway. Yeah, we, we were trying to look at how we could use dead specimens. Mm. Uh, but of course, I guess it's like rhino horn you know whether you legalize it or, or not and and so there was a lot of debate with sandby about that and we we still actually haven't come to a conclusion you know we we get a lot of obviously safe i want to say safe because they haven't been poisoned but safe carcasses yeah um but it's again it's it's a very tricky thing um and i i don't have the answers yeah are there any more questions before we wrap up? Then, uh, uh, Alistair says, fantastic work indeed. I ringed many cave vultures in the 70s and the early 80s with the VSG. I'm not, uh, okay. Then oh, the VSG's vulture study groups. So I worked yeah. for the VSG for two years. That's a small world. <laughs> Yeah, including radio tracking an adult. I happen to catch on a rainy day. Perry, Perry's value-centered holistic approach is truly beautiful. I retire from education soon, and I hope to return to some vulture support. Alistair, thank you. Let's keep in touch. Maybe we can tap into your knowledge from an educational perspective. We would love to have your, your expertise if you're keen. Yeah, that's a good contact to have, yeah. And it's so good that you're going into the schools because I think that's where, it, you know, that's the only solution is to educate, you know, the next generation. And, yeah, well done. Thank you. Okay, no more questions? Thanks, Kerry. Um, Derek, Just a big thank you from me, uh, Lynette, before we close out. Thanks very much, Kerry. Really interesting presentation. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. If anyone wants to also get that video or the link, you can also just look on our YouTube page and that link is there. You can probably download it. Um, but yeah, I thought it was done really well and it just it just included the entire process, which I thought was pretty special to share. Yeah. Um, Derek, what is the next webinar? Can you perhaps tell us? So <clears throat> the next webinar is on the 18th. Uh, of April. Um, I think it's the 18th of April. Let me just double check that it's a Thursday. Uh, that's not a Thursday. <laughs> oh, no, that's March I'm looking at. Sorry. <laughs> it is a Thursday. Um, and it's either going to be by um, um, Do Chun Fai, uh, who is a member of the Learn the Birds team, uh, who lives in Hong Kong. And he's going to be talking about birding in in Hong Kong, or it's going to be about a uh, about birding in Vietnam, with a Vietnamese uh, tour tour birding tour guy. So we haven't uh, got finalization yet. Hopefully, uh, tomorrow or the next day we will finalize and have it up. Yeah, 
on the site. Cool. Yeah. Okay, there's one last question. Kerry, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, what is the voucher program donation link? Um, so you can go again to our website. There is a, a pay fast link there. But David, also, you're welcome to just make contact directly with me if, if that's easiest. But it is on our website. I'm just going to put it here. Yeah, could uh, you put it in the chat box, your um, email yeah. address? Oh, okay, that's perfect. Yeah. And here's my uh, my email as well. www.volpro.com. That's your yeah. website. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, as I said, there is a pay fast link there, but you can also just contact me directly as, as well, whatever is easiest. Thank you. Um, are there any more? No, I think that's it. Thanks so much, Kerry. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.